Today on Trial Watch, this man cracked a vicious sex crime, but he isn't a detective or a DA or even a judge. He's an artist. Then the tragedy of celebrity divorce. You're right up there with all the, the, the big, you know, the, the Hollywood people. But when Nick Nolte divorced her, Hollywood didn't want her. All this and more today on Trial Watch. Real people, real trials. Hello, everyone. I'm Rob Weller. With me is my co-anchor attorney, Lisa Specht. Hello. Welcome to Trial Watch. Well, it was one of the most vicious sex crimes in Los Angeles history. But the case never would have come to trial if it hadn't been for the skills of one man. He's not an investigator or a prosecutor or even a key witness. He's an artist. And now one picture could be worth a thousand years in prison. These people are facing trial for one of the worst crimes in Los Angeles history because of an unexpected courtroom hero, a hero who uses pastels instead of pistols. The ultimate will be not necessarily a photograph of the subject. The ultimate, ultimate goal is to obtain a drawing that contains the characteristics of the suspect. This soft-spoken artist is the man criminals fear most in L.A. His pastels can be more effective fighting crime than sophisticated electronic equipment. And police artist Fernando Ponce says no case illustrates the value of his work like the terrifying story of Myra Quinones. Myra and Dalila Gonzalez were held captive in a tiny camper and forced to endure months of torture. The illegal aliens were sexually assaulted, chained, and beaten. He hit me with a paddle and used electric shock hookups. He didn't give me food or drink for days. She told me that basically she was forced to take care of the children. And uh, quite a few times she was uh, raped by the male suspect. Uh, and many times, uh, at one time that she tried to escape, uh, she received a tremendous beat up. And uh, at that time, I think, is when the hand was damaged. When Myra escaped her prison here in the slums of Los Angeles, her abductors fled from the scene. It didn't look as if they could be caught, much less brought to trial, except for Ponce's artistic skill. No, it was not very difficult. It was very difficult to describe the man who held me prisoner. I have a good memory, but it was hard to get it exact. I used all my ability to uh, elicit characteristics from those faces. And um, that gave her a sense of accomplishment, too. But she did want it to help the police. I, I noticed that. Drawing on his experience of 20 years as a police artist, Ponce sketched pictures of the people Myra described, the people who'd kidnapped and brutalized her. Ponce also drew a detailed replica of the tiny camper where she and Dalila were chained and forced to serve as slaves for three adults and five children. These pictures were so close to reality that after they were aired on local TV news, the police switchboards lit up. From the release of the drawings to the press, to the apprehension of the suspects, the time lapse, I will say, the best of my knowledge, was hours. The composite drawings led police to this house, where they found the camper prison was parked in the backyard. Authorities arrested Paul Garcia, Yolanda Garcia, and Margarita Ruvacaba, charging them with the unspeakable crimes against Myra and Dalila. Deputy District Attorney Andrew McMullen is a hardened prosecutor of sex crimes, but he says he's never seen anything like this. I filed 113 counts, and it was difficult. The filing decision was uh, difficult in this case because the women had been uh, raped almost on a daily basis, and the number of crimes uh, seemed uh, endless, really. What we decided, uh, really, was to file um, there's probably less than a third of the actual crimes that are there, but just to give uh, the idea of what these women went through over a period of time. In the preliminary hearing, the case took an even more bizarre twist. The defendant, Paul Garcia, allegedly stabbed a sheriff deputy in the face. Garcia was then thrown into a holding cell with a violent prisoner and apparently got a taste of his own medicine. He was beaten senseless and is not considered competent to stand trial. However, his alleged female accomplices will answer for the terrible crimes committed against Myra and Dalila. 
Police artist Fernando Ponce says it's the most satisfying case he's ever helped bring to trial. I was a victim then, a passive victim of, the, of that trauma. It was a terrifying story that uh, I, I went home and uh, my wife noticed what's, what's wrong with me. Paul Garcia is still in a mental hospital as a result of his jailhouse beating. So it's not known when or even if he'll stand trial. His two female co-defendants will go before a judge this spring. Now it's a trial that never would have been if it hadn't been for Fernando Ponce. Okay, well next up on Trial Watch, this woman found out her husband was leaving her by watching Entertainment Tonight. It's like a fairy tale. A famous movie star falls madly in love with a common girl and marries her. He introduces her to a fantasy world of fame, fortune, parties, and limos. Suddenly, she's living the Hollywood dream, and the world is her oyster. But what happens if the marriage breaks up? What happens when the fairy tale ends, and it's not happily ever after? Devastated. Completely devastated. Happily ever after was just tornadoed away. These women were married to celebrities. Now they're divorced, stripped of everything they've come to expect. Sharon Nolte was married to actor Nick Nolte and lived the Hollywood dream. You're right up there with all the, the, the big, you know, the, the Hollywood people. And uh, it's like, I'm thinking, here I am, the kid in Los Fields, out in this big limo, and there's, there's nothing better on a Saturday night. <laughs> it's funny, if you were married to a celebrity before they were a celebrity, you think of them as your husband. And every time a little job would come along, I mean, you'd dance around the room going, yay, yay, a miracle, a script, you know, third man, you know. <laughs> then you'd grow up to have a name, you know, in a script. And, and it, it was fun and it was thrilling. For Jackie Joseph, ex-wife of F Troops Ken Berry, the excitement from being the wife of a celebrity came to a halt. Once your spouse attains celebrity status, it's so exciting. You, you start to buy the myth, and you start to think, I'm you know, part of Mr. and Mrs. Special World, or the real trap is I'm part of Mr. Special World, and, and that you're just like some kind of barnacle on their body because you're lucky enough to be a part of them. Um, and then when that goes away due to divorce, some people feel so disintegrated. For people used to living in the lap of luxury, the price of divorce is steep. Warren Adler, who wrote the savagely funny novel War of the Roses, understands divorce. Uh, they immediately lose their cachet in terms of their own, even their own social group. It's one of the really destructive forces of divorce. Uh, a woman married to an important person and vice versa will become quickly unimportant when she loses uh, her, her spouse, who is more celebrated. In addition to losing their clout, celebrity divorcees lose their fat bank accounts. Sharon Nolte used to have carte blanche. I never had to do anything. I mean, this, when I say that, I mean it was like, here is a slip of paper, Sharon, go ahead, legs, draw whatever you want. So when it came to checks, that was like, what does that mean? Okay, and everything was taken care of. Sharon told me that she even charged her groceries. She would charge everything and didn't know how much she spent. She knew how much Nick made uh, per film, but didn't know how much they had, didn't know where they did their banking, knew basically nothing. It's especially devastating uh, for the woman, especially if her uh, means of income and support is also tied in some way uh, to the uh, so-called famous person she's married to. Being divorced from a celebrity adds a new dimension to the word humility. Life becomes an open book for all the public to read. For Sharon Nolte, whose husband Nick named her legs, her divorce was a very open book. It was on Entertainment Tonight. They had said it over the news that Nick Nolte served legs, and I was in shock. People have said, look, I, every time I go to a store, I see my husband with a woman on a magazine, and it's really irritating and I just can't wait to finish checking my groceries out because I don't want to have to look at that. For help in dealing with the unique problems former wives of celebrities share, Jackie Joseph and some other Hollywood exes got together. 
they formed a support group called LADIES. It stands for Life After Divorce is Eventually, Eventually Sane. So we're, we're in this support group, and it sounds kind of weird, you know, ex-wives of famous people. But accidentally, you know, the Lord works in strange ways, as they say. Uh, we've become an outreach uh, program, and we go to speak to people all over the country. While support exists and helps to start the healing process, it doesn't get your husband back, celebrity or not. And when you are the wife, and then you are no longer... You know, sometimes you could just say that you have to take your ball glove and go home now. <laughs> it's no fun. Among the members of Ladies are the ex-wives of Jerry Lewis, Leonard Nimoy, Gene Hackman, Mickey Rooney, and Michael Landon. And when we return, I'll be talking to attorney Connolly Euler, who specializes in celebrity divorces. With me today is attorney Connolly Euler, who specializes in celebrity divorces. Among his clients are the wives of Chuck Norris and John Tesh. Uh, Mr. Euler, what makes celebrity divorces different than other divorces? Because the spouse of the celebrity has to deal with the pain in a magnified effort. Going to the market, seeing the newspapers, turning on the television set, seeing the spouse, maybe in social and other settings. This is something that the normal uh, non-celebrity spouse doesn't have to deal with. In the piece we just saw, we heard that uh, ex-Hollywood wives tend to lose some of their friends, their social status, as well as their husbands when they get divorced. In your experience, is this true? It's true, but that can be true also with non-celebrity wives. And if their friends are really friends, they're not going to lose them. If someone uh, is married to some, a person who is rich and famous, and they are not rich and famous, how does the property get divided? Well, in California, the community property is divided equally. Uh, it's a very simple process in theory, but you have to determine what the community property is, how to value it, and go from there. In a long marriage, that isn't a great problem. But if you have a short marriage, you may have a commingling of mm -hmm. community and separate property, which may or may not have been resolved if they had a premarital agreement. One thing we all see is that uh, people really are enthralled with the details of celebrity divorces. In your experience, is there some way a couple can keep its settlement private? Yes. One way that we used to do a lot of would be to seal the file. But a few years ago, the presiding judge said, you don't seal files. The preferable way now is for a celebrity couple, or actually any couple for that matter, to utilize a private or a rent-a-judge, mm -hmm. where the case is heard, it can be heard in a hotel conference room, in a lawyer's conference room, and the ultimate way to keep it private is to settle it without having to go to a contested hearing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So many times we hear that ex-Hollywood wives have problems that other wives don't have on a divorce, but actually... Uh, an ex-Hollywood wife does have some advantages, doesn't she? Couldn't she use the leverage she has, the fact that her husband's a celebrity, to negotiate a great settlement so that she wouldn't talk to the National Enquirer, for example? Yes, that can be done because a celebrity may not want his uh, private life, his finances, uh, aired either in the print or the video media. So, yes, that could sometimes extract a higher settlement, absolutely. Do you find that in these cases, when they do go to trial, that judges sometimes might be biased? Judges are just people, and they might be um, more biased in favor of the, the famous spouse? Absolutely not. The, we have really outstanding judges hearing these family law matters, and they are not biased one way or the, another. If there is a bias, it might be because of the celebrity status of one or both parties, the case might get very careful attention not only from the judge, but from the lawyers as well. But there's no bias for or against a celebrity. Do you recommend to your clients, either the celebrities or the about-to-be spouses of celebrities, that they have prenuptial agreements? Yes. Uh, I think prenuptial agreements can solve a lot of the problems should there be a later divorce, although I don't personally believe in them. Uh, I think they inject a painful element and I tell any client who comes to me for a premarital agreement, my efforts may result in the wedding being called off. Thank you very much, Mr. Euler. Appreciate you being with us. Back to you, Rob. 
Well, next on Trial Watch, it's old news that the poor can't afford lawyers. But now many lawyers can't afford to help the poor. The law is supposed to be impartial, impartial to race, sex, color, and the size of your bank account. But it often isn't easy for the poor in courtrooms, and it isn't getting any easier. Attorney Laura O'Connor loved her job with legal services, where she felt she could make a difference. But now, like many others across the country, she has been forced to leave. Laura O'Connor just can't afford to do good works. I'm leaving legal services on, um, when I left as a Friday, but I'm here to say goodbye to you and to other people who I haven't said goodbye to. It was Laura O'Connor's last day as a legal advocate for these homeless men in a Stanford, Connecticut shelter. Laura loves fighting for their rights, but is resigning after just two years on the job. These days, she's busy trying to survive herself. Our society believes that, that this job is so rewarding that you don't have to pay us. I think probably the cutbacks in the last nine years almost put us out of existence, and certainly there was a cap on salaries. That cap left Laura unable to repay $40,000 in student loans. So now the cold, hard economic facts of life. Laura has to give up the job she loves just to pay her bills. I just can't live like that anymore. Laura feels guilty about leaving the clients who have become her family. I feel that I'm leaving people in the lurch a little bit. There's a lot of uh, emotional involvement, commitment, and in order to do your job well, you have to really immerse yourself in the community. We're one of the few watchdogs for our clients who are relatively powerless and uh, have no other spokesperson. Without Laura, cases like Willie King's would surely fall through the cracks. It was an intact family, and both husband and wife worked, and she got cancer, and she was forced to quit her job and because of the loss of income, it slid into an eviction action, and they were evicted, and uh, their goods were put in storage. My neighbors took us in for a week while we were in the process of trying to locate a place, which we did not. Once a middle-class family, the Kings were forced to move to this tiny basement apartment. All the possessions from their three-story home were immediately carted away by the city. She had made an informal agreement with the city to keep the storage, and they threw it away without even notifying her. Absolutely everything, and they lost 20 years of their life. It was Laura who sued Stanford on Willie's behalf, and Laura who won in court, and won not only for Willie. An injunction was issued to prevent others in Willie's situation from ever going through that kind of pain and suffering. It's difficult to detach when you have clients like the King family. I certainly, uh, at the hearing, the preliminary injunction hearing, it was the first time where uh, after she testified, I had to ask for uh, a recess because I was so choked up that I was afraid I was going to cry. Although legal aid is still fighting Stanford to recover Willie's losses, no victory is in sight. And so Willie and her family are trying to scrape together enough money so they can leave their four crowded rooms filled with borrowed furniture. A recession hits families like the Kings very hard, yet the Laura O'Connors of the world are facing their own harsh reality. Being a lawyer to the poor doesn't pay the bills, no matter how satisfying the work. It's trade-off, I suppose, with the money versus the rewards. I'm not going to get the rewards that I've had here. Laura says there are fewer and fewer lawyers to help the poor. One of the reasons may be that a first-year attorney with legal services earns about $20,000 but in private practice, that same attorney can earn four times as much. All right, now let's go right back to Lisa in her attorney function today with uh, our snap judgment. And this is a good one. How many times has this happened to you? You're at a concert or a sporting event, and you're standing in the long, long line for the ladies' room. You look enviously at the men's room, where the line is much shorter, if there's a line at all. And you think, gee, I'd really like to go over there. Well, that's just what Denise Wells did at a Houston concert. She avoided the long line, but couldn't avoid the long arm of the law. Denise was charged with violating a city ordinance which forbids using the wrong restroom in, quote, a manner calculated to cause a disturbance. How do you, the jury, find? Should Denise Wells be fined as much as $200 for using the men's room? The actual verdict right after this.
Well, let's find out the result of today's snap judgment. Is Denise Wells guilty or not guilty of disturbing the peace by using a men's room? Well, after deliberating only 23 minutes, the jury said no. They found that Ms. Wells did not enter the men's room with the intent to cause a disturbance. And with that, we will end it today. That is it for Trial Watch. We'll see you tomorrow. Real people, real trials. Bye.